Greetings. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I'm Lexi Eve, and welcome back to another video on magic and theory and practice. Today we'll be going over chapter 17 of The License to Depart, and it's a short one, so let's just dive right into it. The License to Depart is a very short passage that was utilized by the Golden Dawn and many orders and practitioners of today. And it's employed at the end of various rituals, initiations, evocations, and even invocations to clear the space when one's working is completed. Also, it is given a three paragraph chapter in the Goisha, or the Lesser Key of Solomon, which has the passage that you recite, and two more paragraphs after giving some extra information to the magician. I'll just read the page from the Goisha quickly. Quote, O thou, spirit's name, and you could say spirit, you could say the divine light, you could say energy, elementals, or if you're working with a specific type of entity, class of entity, or name of an entity, you would just say, O oh, thou, and then, etc. Because thou hast diligently answered unto my demands, and hast been very will ready and willing to come in my call, I do here license thee to depart unto thy proper place, without causing harm or danger unto man or beast. Depart then, I say, and be thou very ready to come in my call, being duly exercised and conjured by the sacred rites of magic. I charge thee to withdraw peaceably and quietly, and the peace of God be ever continued between thee and me. Amen. After thou hast given the spirit license to depart, thou art not to go out of the circle until he or they be gone, and until thou shalt have made prayers and rendered thanks unto God for the great blessings he hath bestowed upon thee in granting thy desires, and delivering thee from all the malice of the enemy, the devil. Also note, thou mayest command these spirits into the vessel of brass, in the same manner as thou dost into the triangle by saying, Thou that dost forthwith appear before this circle, in this vessel of brass, in a fair and comely shape, etc., etc., as hath been shown in the foregoing conjurations. End quote. Starting with the first paragraph, that is actually recited to release any spirits one has summoned, it can be used after almost any ritual, not just operations of evocation, to release spirits, elementals, deities, or even the divine light, and as I said, all you need to do is state what you are releasing, and then use the recitation accordingly. Your words bind it to go peacefully, without causing any harm, to come to you or anyone else, and then you can call it again at your will. It's a nice way to end your ceremony. It is pretty much the equivalent of doing a banishing, but without decharging any magical weapons, and lasts permanently, as opposed to, say, the LBRP, which I generally believe has a shelf life, a shell life of 24 to 48 hours. The paragraph instructs a magician to remain in their circle until they see the spirit or energy depart, and also to pray thanks to God. This, of course, is an act of humility, and it should be noted that the powers of the magician come from the divine, so without keeping that link strong, one is powerless. The third and final paragraph reminds the magician that they can change the wording so that they force the spirit into a brass vessel, and I'll not go into that topic today, but it's an idea I may make a video about it in the near future. On to the chapter by Crowley in Magic and Deerian Practice, quote, after a ceremony has reached its climax, anti-climax must inevitably follow. But if the ceremony has been successful, this anti-climax is merely formal. The magician should rest permanently on the higher plane to which he has aspired. And there's a footnote which says, The rock climber who relaxes on the face of the precipice falls to earth, but once he has reached a safe ledge he may sit down. To continue the quote of the opening paragraphs of this chapter, Quote, the whole force of the operation should be absorbed, but there is almost certain to be a residuum, since no operation is perfect. And, even if it were so, there would be a number of things, sympathetic to the operation, attracted to the circle. These must be duly dispersed, or they will degenerate and become evil, end quote. Thus, recitation of the license to depart, with force of will behind your words, is the anticlimax a cleansing of the space of all things invoked, evoked, or that saw a light in the darkness, and via curiosity, came to the perimeter of one's circle. Uh, side note, this is not in my script, but 
I, I was debating whether to write it in or not. I'll just say it. Um, when we do the Lamp of Invisible Light ritual, so many times me or my fiance, or whether we're in the circle or being the officiant of the ritual, we have guardians that come to the and sit down in empty chairs or stand behind people, and they're beings of light. But sometimes outside the circle there are also entities and i've seen human-esque entities and angelic looking entities and even very animalistic looking entities of all various shapes sizes creatures types of species and it's like the world is darkness there's a lot of darkness in the universe and when you set up a circle like even the lbrp you're creating a light in the darkness that attracts whatever is close enough to see that light and Though they may be of a low spirit type nature, so they can't enter the circle, they are attracted like a moth to the flame, and they come to the perimeter of the circle or stand at a distance, and they observe. And um, you want to make sure that you clear your space before you step outside that circle of all of these type of things. So Crowley writes that after an evocation, sometimes a spirit, even one who has sworn obedience, may refuse to leave once told to go. In such a case, the license to depart is the ticket. But again, you must know how to put will behind your words and your movements in a ritual. Else, they are just words and movements and are empty gestures and you are not in control and run the risk of being controlled. Quote, should he fail to disappear immediately, it is a sign that there is something very wrong. The magician should immediately reconsecrate the circle with the utmost care. He should then repeat the dismissal, and if this does not suffice, he should then perform the banishing ritual suitable to the nature of the spirit, and if necessary, add conjurations to the same effect. In these circumstances, or if anything else suspicious should occur, he should not be content with the apparent disappearance of the spirit, who might easily make himself invisible and lie in ambush, to do the magician a mischief when he stepped out of the circle, or even months afterwards." End quote. Now the rest of this chapter turns into a lecture about the magical record, and you can find a link to that in the description below, as I've already made a video on the subject of the magical diary, so I'm only going to quote a few select points. Quote, immediately after the license to depart, and the general closing up of the work, it is necessary that the magician should sit down and write up his magical record, however much he may have been tired. He ought to be refreshed, more than after a full night's deep sleep. This forms one test of his skill. By the ceremony, he ought to force himself to do this until it becomes a habit. Verily, it is better to fail in the magical ceremony than to fail in writing down an accurate record of it." End quote. Now, the magical diary cannot be overemphasized. Every ritual, every success, every failure, every idea that may be an indication of your true will, and anything that happens in your life which may be connected to your great work must be recorded in your magical record. I've already made a video on the subject, but it's worth repeating that the discipline of writing in the diary every day, as many times as is needed, builds up a discipline inside of the magician that is more valuable than almost anything else. Quote, From one point of view, magical progress actually consists in deciphering one's own record. For this reason, it is the most important thing to do on strictly magical grounds. But apart from this, it is absolutely essential that the record should be clear, full, and concise because it is only by such a record that your teacher can judge how it is best to help you. Your magical teacher has something else to do besides running around after you all the time, and the most important of all his functions is that of the auditor. Now, if you call in an auditor to investigate a business, and when he asks for the books, you tell him that you have not thought it worthwhile to keep any, you need not be surprised if he thinks you every kind of an ass." End quote. And lastly, a footnote to this reads, quote, as one is a star in the body of Nuith, every successive incarnation is a veil, and the acquisition of the magical memory, a gradual unveiling of that star, of that god." End quote. Another time I'll go into Lieber the Sharb um, and looking back at past lives. And the commonality between the magical record and looking at your past lives is that you're supposed to be looking for threads of karma, threads of actions, threads of critical moments in your life, this incarnation and previously, because when you do that, you could start to connect the thread from event to event and see what the commonality is. 
And in doing that, sometimes you're able to see indications of what your true will is, whether it's a true will that's been going on for many incarnations or just this one. But you have to look back sometimes and see where you came from in order to see what you need to do and where you're going. So that's one of the main core concepts of why it's important to write in the magical diary and also to do past life regression type work. Just you want to get that idea of what you've done and what you've experienced already so you can get a better idea of what you need to do and what you need to experience as we go forward. Love is the law. Love under will. I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.